Welcome to the Farcast here at Shadron State College. I'm Daniel Binkert with my co-host Alex Helmbrecht, and we're here with Tawny Tibbetts, who is an associate professor over in the Science Building. Uh, and I know there's a lot of cool stuff going on over there. Always, uh, we, we are always happy to to uh, stop in there and see what you guys are up to. Hopefully, you know we got some of the like uh, colored chemicals and explosions mm-hmm. and mathematical symbols, um, and a planetarium show. Yeah, I love it. So uh, before we get into all that, Tawny, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up and go to school? I am an Iowan. So I grew up in southern Iowa in a little town called Centerville. And then after that, I ran off and I went to the University of Iowa, got my bachelor's there, and um, I double majored in geoscience and anthropology. And then I went to the University of Texas at San Antonio, where I got my master's in anthropology looking at archaeology. Nice. And then I went back to Iowa, and I got my Ph.D. in geoscience looking at geoarchaeology. It seems like a very busy time and um, very focused. It's, <laughs> it's focused, but also the path I chose was because I couldn't focus. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. I thought, maybe I'll go paleontology, and they said, well, pick a species. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> I can't do that forever. Um, nice. So I tried to keep myself as broad as I could for as long as I could. So when they say pick a species, like uh, you'd be focusing on the troodon itself for, for the yeah. whole career and that's that? Yep. Man. Yep. There, that, that I, does... I have friends who look at one specific croc species. Some yeah. of them get to be a little more generalist, but you have to you know get to be an expert in something. And I, I like to be... Um, just knowledgeable to be dangerous in, in a lot of things. Yeah. Not that's what quite I an expert there. That's what I always liked about watching, you know, the dinosaur documentaries when I was a kid and it seemed like the paleontologists were just experts on everything. They yeah. go from ankylosaurs to apatosaurs and everything in between and like but you get your specialty. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, so was it bang, yeah. bang, bang, bang? Oh, yeah. So was, you did your master's right after your grad or your undergrad. And then Probably not my dissertation. smartest move, but I did. I went right through, no breaks. Um, yep, I finished um, Iowa guess, in no 09, breaks. went right to Texas in the fall of 09, finished. Actually, I overlapped, and I was finishing my master's while I started my PhD. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, got out of there in five years, so... That's um, awesome. Yeah, I PhD before thirty. Pretty proud of that one. But she seems reasonably be. sane, having survived all of that. That's oh, great. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, that, practice. No, that's oh, yeah. rare company though. A PhD before thirty. Yeah, so good job. Nice. I was pretty excited about it. I, yeah, it it was definitely. Go, go, go. But it was good. It was good. Now you have all that earning potential for the rest of your career. Oh, yeah. just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, all that learning potential. Oh, right, right, right. That's right, it. right, right. Yep. Yeah. Same thing. <laughs> so, Tawny, where did your love of, of, of geology, geoscience, and, and, you know, maybe rocks in particular first begin? Oh. Uh. <laughs> Because when I think of Iowa, I don't necessarily think of rocks. I grew up in a rock quarry. Do they okay. do they have to pull the rocks out of the farm fields, or is that just yep. a New England thing? So we did, we did, we're through. glaciated. Oh, so that's a, those are glacial erratics that you pull out of the till. Right. So when you go through and you till your field, and you got all those like basketball size and bigger rocks, those came down from the glaciers right. in parts of Iowa and then the north uh, northeast. But uh, my family had a limestone quarry, and so my grandpa he owned the quarry and. They they had to dig down for the rocks. Okay. They, were, they weren't there. You had to go under. You had to you had to blast for them. But my dad would take us, my sister and I, on Sundays when the quarry was quiet, and we'd go and we'd dig through the big riprap piles, and we'd get to find fossils. He had his real carpenter hammer and a screwdriver. That's really <laughs> all you need. Chisel them out. <laughs> <laughs> so we went and we played in the rocks on the Sundays. And nice. Um, then my other side of the family, my mom's side, they are farmers. And there was always something to dig up, mm-hmm. always. They had an old farmstead, and so I'd go out and I would dig up um, pot shirts. <laughs> and so I would be digging up ceramics from back and like oh, trying to great. put them back together. And so it was uh, an early fondness for digging things up. Nice. Yeah. What kind of fossils did you find? Um, so Iowa was an inland sea at that point, a tropical inland sea. And so we would find um, seashells, a lot of brachiopods, which are a special kind of, mm-hmm. uh, like, different from an oyster uh, in there. <laughs> so <laughs> symmetry. And uh, we get trilobites and crinoids. And every once in a while you get lucky and find um, a decent-sized trilobite. But I was never good at that. I found lots and lots of crinoids. Cool. So they look like SpaghettiOs. 
Excellent. And what is a, a crinoid? What crinoid. Is so they are sometimes called sea lilies, but they're animals, and they still are around. Okay. So try um, just not in Iowa. Just not in Iowa. No, <laughs> they are. Um, they need lots of waves, like lots of agitated water and cold water, and so they have like long stalks, like that anchor them to the ground. Some kinds, and then they have like a head and or like a head type nubbin, and they've got filter feeders. They've got fans on the top, and so they you get the the stalks most commonly. That's interesting. Yeah, they're cool. So I've like. Yeah, been in deep time fossils for for all of my life. So is your sister a geologist too? She's a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> She's no, my she, she can write prescriptions. Yes, my mom always gets mad at me and she says you're both real doctors, but no, she's a, a pediatric nephrologist at the University of Iowa Children's Hospital. So oh, doing good she, work there. Yes, yeah. she's a transplant specialist, and we're all very proud of her and the work she does there. So she's doing some really cool stuff. Nice. So, yeah. But so, she doesn't like rocks as much as me. The big question that comes to my mind is, did you get to ever uh, push the button to detonate the explosives? No. Dang. But they let me watch every once in a while. Yeah. And, you know, so it's loud. So, you know, you don't can't get the kids around very often. But um, we lived close enough to the quarry that we'd hear the, like, whatever, 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, the last blast of the day, and we knew Dad would be home soon. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we could set our clock by the blasting. <laughs> That's great. Like the, like the dinner bell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, do you have uh, advice for rookie rock hunters? Uh, what should we look for? Where should we look? Um, what can we expect to find? Uh, out here. <laughs> yeah, let's um, out here. Always be sure you're on public lands. That's right. the first and foremost is make sure that you're not on somebody you don't want to trespass. So always make sure you're on areas where you can collect because you can't collect in certain parks or um, like the national parks, the state parks. They have no collecting places like Toadstool. Right. Um, like national forest land is is that open? Or yeah, what, what what are the various levels of public land that you can and can't? Um, Bureau of Land Management lands. Most of those, like some of them, you can. Some of the, it's it's worth looking up and going okay. to your, your your forestry experts. Okay. And asking them before you go out. It's always better to ask permission than to have to uh, try to get that forgiveness after. Mm -hmm. uh, especially you know with the the government system. So, but when you're out there, if you're looking for well, my life is geodes. And then out here, it's all agates, but they look pretty similar. They're usually going to be nodules, so like lumpy, bumpy, but mostly spherical. They don't look like much on the outside. It's when you get them open or polish, the, polish them up that you get to see the really cool insides. Mm -hmm. But um, So is that something we'd find like embedded in the sandstone out here? Some places, yep. Some okay. of them, they wash out pretty easy because the, the chert and the agate are much harder Right. than the sandstones or the limestones around here. So a lot of times they'll weather out and you can find them just kind of like loose. You don't have to go really digging for them. Okay. Um, but you can also find there's lots of fossils out there. Um, just got to find the right t time period of rocks. And there's good geologic maps out there. But Dr. Lighty's the expert in this area, man. I could I could find fossils for you in Iowa, but Dr. Lighty's got it out here. I haven't. Nice. I, I moved here with a six-week-old. And, I'm sure that was fun. <laughs> yeah. From South Florida for four days we moved here. Oh. And then COVID hit. And then I had another kid. And so I haven't got to go out and do much collecting yet. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a sad resource for that right now. I assume so. you're, you're um, would it be inculcating? Is that, is that right? Anyway, getting the kids interested at a young oh, age. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, Briar has a big jar, one of those uh, that came, it's a bear-shaped jar that had a bunch of... Um, Graham crackers in it or animal yeah. crackers? Oh, yeah. She's filling it up. Nice. Mostly with our driveway. But, you got to start know, somewhere. You got to start somewhere. <laughs> so we have some polished um, agates that I got from somebody. They were like, I've just got this box of rocks. And so I put them outside, and she, she finds them and brings them back in. And then every few months, I dump them back outside, <laughs> and she finds them again. Yeah. And it's exciting. So, yep. yeah. But Griffin, he's uh, starting to get into rocks. He's starting to get there. But he's he's still pretty little. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, times. if there's dirt involved, children will find it. Oh, so yes. <laughs> don't worry about that. <laughs> um, so it, you recently returned from a spring break <laughs> research trip to Belize. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I got back to town on Friday. <laughs> so very recently. Very uh, recently. Yeah. I still got the bug bites. Um, so I went down uh, the Friday before spring break after classes 
wrapped up, hit the road, got to Denver and flew to Belize. And I was in Crooked Tree, Belize, which um, they have a nature preserve there, a biological wildlife um, area preserve. And so it was my first time in Crooked Tree. It was absolutely fabulous. Mm -hmm. So nice. Uh, The people there were wonderful, so welcoming. Everybody wanted to talk and have a good time. Um, but we were down there. I was down there with one other colleague, uh, Marika Brauerberg. She's at the University of Vermont. And um, we met up. She's one of the PI, so primary investigators for the site, the research group I was with, which is the Belize River East Archaeology Project, Brea. Okay. And so they've collected all this stuff. They've excavated, done surface collections. They've been down um, in the Belize River Valley for years now. And I went down and analyzed their granite in 2014. So this was a go back and get 2014 through now and analyze what they've got there. I, uh, I work on granite, and I took down um, our portable X-ray fluorescence analyzer Mm -hmm. that we got. Dr. Lighty and I um, got that um, a year and a half ago with funds that were from EBSCOR and uh, the the college. Mm -hmm. And um, I analyzed the granite to see where it came from in the Maya Mountains of Belize. So the Maya Mountains have three different types of granites, and one of them just dominates the tool market. We're not sure why, but it is just a dominating force most of the tools that are made out of granite come from this one place, in, and it's somewhere in Mountain Pine Ridge, and we're trying to figure out why. We're trying to figure out where other pieces of granite are coming from and why the other two zones weren't used as much. So, so. these are prehistoric tools? Oh, uh, historic. Okay. Well, co- technically, because the Maya wrote, so we do get to, they are, they are ancient, so they are Maya, and um, they are monos and matates. So the mono is what we call the passive stone. It's the big guy that's like, what is this, a foot and a half long? Sure. Yeah. Um, Give or take. Yeah. And they're about a foot wide, and you push the mono, the hand stone, across it, and you crush whatever's in there. And so you push and you crush your corn or your cacao or your pigments or whatever you want to grind up. And so everybody had one. Mm-hmm. And they weren't all made of granite. They were made of anything. Any available rock, which can you imagine making your corn tortillas out of sandstone? That's going to be a gritty tortilla. Yeah, that would be <laughs> a, d- be a little gritty, dental issue. Gritty tortilla, but they did because you got to use what you have. Sure. And so I, I picked the granite because nobody has been able to geochemically source granite without having to take a rock, crush it up, make it into a powder, and analyze the powder because okay. it's such a chunky rock. And so I figured out with my dissertation a way to take the portable XRF and make an average out of five randomly selected data points that is statistically the same as if I took that rock, ground it up into a flower, and then analyzed the powder. So, okay. So I figured out a way to non-destructively source between mm-hmm. those three regions in Belize. Now, if I remember right, you did a Graves lecture presentation yes. and talked about some of this stuff, yes. right? So I want I want to make sure our audience knows, and I'll have a link to that as well in the notes for for this episode because you get yes. some pictures to go with it. Right? Yeah, that'll be helpful. But yeah, it was it was. I have three different granites, and I figured out how to basically source the tools without having to destroy the tools, which is obviously great for the archaeologist. Oh, yeah. So. I've been to over a dozen sites in Belize and analyzed all the granite from their sites and kind of put together where these tools were largely coming from. And it's Mountain Pine Ridge. Right. But so this might be a silly question, mm. but you said there's three different types of granite? Mm-hmm. I just always assume there's just granite. Right. So they vary very little. They vary, very little. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's, let's get a reference point. What is Mount Rushmore for granite? It's a pegmatite. Okay. So that's a whole different oh, part. Oh, Oh, man. it's big grains. Okay. And so with um, the three types of granite in Belize, we've got the coxcomb basin, which is the oldest granite. And so it has more of um, the plagioclase feldspars. It's more white and almost a little bluish. And then um, when you go to the hummingbird, which is kind of a little bit north, the hummingbird granite, has more micas in it, mm-hmm. so it's got a little bit more shiny bits, right. but it's also in the white family, like 
creamy. It has they all have some darker minerals in them too, but they're more of the lighter color. And then when you get to the western portion, it's all one magma chamber. They're all related. They're all siblings. Okay. <laughs> and so once you get to number three, Mountain Pine Ridge is the youngest. And with the way magma works, you get a darker plagioclase first, then a lighter plagioclase, and those that's a feldspar. Then you get into potassium feldspar, which is pink, and Mountain Pine Ridge is pink. All right. And some of it is a lighter pink, and you can't really see that it's got a lot of potassium feldspar in it. But it's all about the proportion of potassium feldspar to plagioclase feldspar and the amount of mica in it, like muscovite or biotite mica. And uh, you can tell the difference really easy if you take the rock, you cut it up, you turn it into a microscope slide. Mm -hmm. But again, you don't want to do that with your artifacts. Right. So um, they are all related. They you can't really tell the difference between them visually all the time. Sometimes you can, but um, mineralogically and chemically, they are different. Okay. Yeah. And uh, gosh, it was hard to find that granite. <laughs> so the Coxcomb Basin, it took me three field seasons to ever see a granite in a mountain in that region because it is so deep oh, wow. into the jungle. It was a very long hike. It was, yeah, it was a really long hike in and a really long hike out. And that was, it took me three field seasons to get in there. It's also a jaguar preserve. <laughs> so you have some added fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Hummingbird Ridge, you can see some of You can actually walk up to parts of the mountains and they're bare and you can find the granite right there on the surface. And then Mountain Pine Ridge is a whole different ecosystem because it's pine instead of like rainforest jungle. And so you can really get to the granite there super easy, which is probably why it's such a dominating force for making the tools. But we don't know for sure. But it's, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a really, really cool place. Nice. Yeah, absolutely fabulous. And spent a whole month, my first field season, learning the granites and learning where they are and where to find them and what they look like. And, oh, a lot of rocks. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of rocks. Yes. We love them. Uh, and any other places that you've been to to conduct research? None yet. Okay. I always wanted to get up to Mexico, to the basin of Mexico, and get into the Aztecs, but I haven't. So maybe someday. All you right. never know. But and any other places on the wish list? Oh, gosh. Honestly, I just really like Belize. There's well, a lot works. left to do there. I'm, yeah, we have such a really cool research project going on, and it it's just kind of home. <laughs> Like it's that's that's my research place. So oh, that's great. Just, How often do you go back? Well, this is my first time since 2015. Okay. Yeah. So I'm. So it's not like every other month. No. <laughs> usually they go once or twice a year. The archaeologists. Okay. So the main field seasons during the summer. Most work that gets done in Belize by in general archaeologists is between May and July. That's the dry season, and or sorry. That's going to get right into the wet season. So the end of the summer, it starts to get really rainy, mm -hmm. and it gets really hard to do anything. But usually May and June are pretty busy down there for archaeologists. And then some people get to go back, and they do a winter term, and they'll go between December and January. So this uh, March trip was very strange. <laughs> we don't normally go during March, but the ticket prices were there, <laughs> and oh, the good. time was there, and so we did it. But, cool. Yeah. So uh, uh, Daniel mentioned that you are, are one of the lovely residents of the Center of Innovative Learning yes. on our campus. Uh, how's it been this year? How, oh. how are your students responding to the new space? Oh, it's great. It's so fun Good. to see them all together again. Like to have all of the professors for math and science in one place, to have all of our students in one place that they can call home. It's been really nice to see them get used to the space, I to bet. see the students, like, you know who's going to be in which study area, and you know where to find them now, and they've really made it home. And so it's it's just so fun to see that, and, like, to see research getting done by the students in our wonderful facilities, and, yeah, it's been a really exciting year. Have you been able to unpack all of those rocks? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. We're working on it. We're working on it. Um, we're, we're waiting on some shelving. You know, the supply chain is right. backed up nationally. So, but we're, we're getting there. We're getting organized. We found all of our rocks and minerals we need to teach. So check plus there for us. But we're still finding, we're, we're being very intentional with how we put things away, which means it takes longer. 
So. Sure. You got to have the organization, though. Yeah, absolutely. You, you're only going to do it once. We, yeah. You might think, oh, well, I'll just put it here and I'll come back for it. You're not coming back. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what is like the uh, tracking card catalog system if you need to hunt down a specimen? How do you how do you find it? Or in the ideal future, how will you find it? Now the the museum is all Dr. Lighty, so okay. he has his own. He has um, an amazing storage facility down there with um, by site and location. Okay. But upstairs in more of like the teaching collection, um, it's going to be probably by first minerals, and then the minerals will go in by types. You okay. know, you've got your oxides, your halides, your sulfides. So get those all by by type. And then our rocks by type, so we'll have our igneous together in a, in a shelving unit, and then the sedimentary in however many shelving units we need for them. And yeah, yeah so get them kind of together. And then um, they're all labeled by type, so all of our rock types get to just hang out together. So you find the right, sh- the right uh, bookshelf or right. shelf unit and find your right shelf, and you'll be fine. Nice. Yeah, it'll be okay. Um, so before I get to the next question, I, I was going to say, yeah, I talk about students – populating the study spaces and that was I remember doing the tours of the building um, before it was you know finished and like all these little niches and, and yeah. cubby holes and stuff like people and to hear that and see them as I've been walking through there yeah people have found a space and mm-hmm. it it kind of recaptures that feeling we had in the old building especially around the central central staircase yeah. there'd always be students uh, always. studying and preparing for the next test oh yeah it's really nice yeah it's such a good feeling so uh, an, an extra nice place, the planetarium. What what goes on in the planetarium and why should people come and see a show? I am so glad you asked because it is just an out-of-this-world space. It is. <laughs> oh, I've got... Uh, I've got a billion good astronomy and geology puns. Um, so the the planetarium is open for any teachers if they want to come in um, from the campus. Faculty are invited to bring their classes. We have a few videos that um, are could tangentially be related. I'm... Uh, we have one about losing the dark. That would be good for um, if you're talking about light pollution and oh, that yeah. sort of stuff. But um, in general, oh, our I thought it was a reference to really? Dark Side of the Moon. Oh, I do like have that. Play, like play laser laser show. I have that. It's 45 <laughs> minutes. It's the whole album. Can we combine it with The Wizard of Oz? I mean, we could probably figure it out. <laughs> but um, Let's do that. yeah, yep. our main target and what who um, comes in the most are the the K through twelve people, the students. So we love having school groups come yeah. in, and it's free of charge for teachers to bring their students in and come and see a show. So uh, we do night sky tours. So the first thing that happens is um, our projectionist puts up what would what the sky would look like tonight. Yeah. Or on an average night after sunset. And they walk you through what constellations you can see and tell you a little bit about the stories behind the constellations. And then we trans um, trans transfer transfer? Yeah. <laughs> we move over to a, a movie. And we've got a wide selection of shows there. Um, and you get to watch a nice movie and hopefully not fall asleep because those chairs are so yeah, comfortable. They are. They are. And um, we do some fun outreach. We do uh, free Fridays. We have one coming up, I think, next week um, where we do a show. We do two different shows in the afternoon. I try to time them for the Shadron Public School early out days. And so there's one at 2, and then it starts again at 3. And we do a nice, like, 45-minute program each week or each time we have a free Friday. And then coming up in April, we have our last Dome After Dark, which is the the evening show where you can come in at 7 and right. maybe skip the, the crowd and come in for an evening uh, planetarium time. So I, I'm curious, Tani, that the planetarium seems a ways away from geology and uh-huh. digging. Uh-huh. Does that fall under duties as a sign? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. It's been fun, but it's definitely been a learning curve. Yeah, sure. So I just... Uh, well, I, you bring a lot of a, a lot of exuberance yeah. to it and a lot of passion. That's I have sure. found that if you're not an expert, at least be enthusiastic. Yeah, so, I think that's a great, a great way to go through life. Oh, yeah. I, I try. I, I like being enthusiastic about things. It's way more fun than being bored. Yeah. So, but I, yeah, it's been a, a big learning experience and I've really enjoyed it. I've gotten much better at telescopes, which has been a really fun time. And I used to do stargazing. Like I remember watching hale when it came by in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And um, what was the other one? Halley's Comet. No, hale And there was another Halley's Comet. It came through in like think, the 90s. Yeah. So my dad was big into uh, astronomy, and so we would always go out and look up. And I grew up in a place like this where you could look up. Yeah. I lived outside of town, and so, yeah, you could always see the stars. Mm -hmm. 
So it's been kind of fun getting to yeah. really know that sort of stuff. That's been one of my favorite things that I, I need to get back and do some more, but go Toadstool Park at night oh. and use those shapes as a foreground with the star field behind. I bet Just beautiful. Be great. Yeah. Um, so kind of switching gears again, uh, moving away from astronomy and back to geoscience, how important is it for the general populace to understand geoscience? What, like, what's your elevator speech? How do you, how do you try to get um, a bunch of new geologists into the fold? What, give us your pitch. I have one sentence that I use, and okay. the more you think about it, the more it wrinkles your brain. Everything that you interact with every day was either mined or grown. And if you're growing anything, you're growing it in the soil, and that is just decomposed rock. So everything comes down to the solid earth. Everything. Oh, yeah. But absolutely everything around us was either mined from the ground or grown in the ground. And so understanding geology, understanding the systems, understanding... Um, how the, how the physical world works is super important because you're living on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're going to have a house someday. You don't want to be in the floodplain. You don't want to be on a sinkhole. You don't want to be where a landslide could happen. You want to know if there's an earthquake that p could be a risk. And so you need to know a little bit about how the world works. Yeah. It's not just all, you know, dinosaurs and fossils, oh my, but it is a lot of like everything we do. How people are arranged on the landscape is geology. Mm -hmm. So, like, where the major cities are in the world comes down to where yeah. they could live. And that's based on the geological resources. Oh, yeah. So it's all, it all comes back to the geology. Mm -hmm. we, you have to know it. And you need to at least have an appreciation for um, Mother Nature because she always bats last. <laughs> There's no <laughs> doubt about that. <laughs> Yeah. No, that, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. I've always kind of thought of geology as, as it's always kind of just there. Right. You, you know, and so you tend to lose sight of it uh, because it's maybe mundane to a fault. I Oh, fault. Good so There you go. I like, there's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a geology <laughs> I like part that, for you. Yeah. No, I always work hard in my classes to make sure that they know that geology is not done. Yeah. No. It's all still happening. And um, there are still discoveries being made. There are still things to uncover, questions to answer. And some of them are really important. Like, what do you think is happening on Mars? That's geology in planetary geology. Mm -hmm. So NASA really loves getting geoscientists because oh, yeah. how can you interpret the structure of other planets and the potential to terraform other planets unless you know how it would work here? Yeah. And like what the rocks are like, what the capabilities are. Yeah. So I think it's absolutely foundational and crucial that everybody take a geology class. But that's, yeah. I'm a little biased. <laughs> that's know. okay. Nothing wrong with that. Right. Nothing wrong with that at all. I seem to recall we had at least one geoscience student in the last 10 years that did like a internship at NASA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's great stuff. Mm -hmm. He's still with NASA. He's oh, there, 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 there was a... Uh, a Oh, Brittany. One of our female students. Brittany Lovett. Oh, so there's yes. like two or three of them then. Yeah, Brit, there's been a Brit few. did yeah. her internship there, and oh gosh, I am kicking myself for not remembering his name. But we have a, stu a former student who's there. He works at NASA. Excellent. He was at JPL, and he just transferred or just got uh, is moved to a different location now. So. That's great. Yeah, but it you there's geology everywhere. It's one of those careers where you can go anywhere on Earth. And or to the stars. Or, yeah, or <laughs> yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, there's Mars. always planetary material. There's always rock material. You need geologists on the ocean. You need them in the air. We're everywhere. And it's an important field that I don't think enough people are uh, interested in. I mean, if it were up to me, everyone would be interested in it. But, the more the better. Right? Yeah. So um, our next question is, when you're not hunting for rocks... What uh, other activities do you enjoy outside of the office? <laughs> uh, I raised two small humans. Nah, I got two kids. That's that definitely it. <laughs> they keep me very busy. Uh, they're great. I've got my three-year-old Briar and my one-year-old Griffin, and uh, we like to take walks. Very good. We like to go to the state park, and we teach them about uh, the plants and the animals and the rocks. And um, so we like to get out and do some hiking and do some of that fun stuff. Uh, it's been hard. I forget what I do during the summer because winter has lasted forever. Yeah, this has been a weird one for yeah. being able to hike outside. It's yeah, long. yeah. Very so I'm like, long. wait, what do I do when I'm not in snow? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, 
I I have my traditional millennial habits. I, I crochet and I cross stitch. <laughs> Seems like we all do that. I did not get into baking sourdough bread. Uh, the, my husband Matt does that. <laughs> oh, good. At least somebody did. <laughs> well, yeah. You gotta gotta give him those. some yeah. of those, right? We'll take your millennial card back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Briar does love avocado toast. We're passing it on. <laughs> good for you. Good. <laughs> but, yeah. No. I. We're just quiet homebodies. So I. We don't travel too much yet. Once the kids get bigger, we're gonna hit up some of the good campsites around here. Yeah. You're at a yeah. tough age to. Yeah. Oh, it's only a matter of time before you can take him down to Belize as lab assistants. Oh, there there are plans. Nice. There are plans. <laughs> so hopefully, yeah. maybe take a babysitter along too, just in case they don't want to cooperate. <laughs> you can actually do some right? work. Right. <laughs> I was thinking a, a a grandma. Yeah. Yeah. Grandmas are great for that right? type of. That's yes. kind of what they were built for. They're great for it, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, we got great grandmas and grandpas in ours in our group. So, but uh, the nice thing is, is the two other like so. Uh, the site, uh, the Brea sites are run by Ellen, Ellie Harrison Buck, and she's at the University of New Hampshire, and she's had her kids there. And so the team is used to kids, and Marika has a kid, and so there are children around. And oh, good. So there's a That's nice— perfect. It's great. It's such a nice environment, and, like, Belize is just great. So it, I cannot wait to get them down there. Briar is already ready. She's got her bags packed. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> that is— so, Tani, we're at the point um, in our interview today where we're going to ask you some quick questions, okay. and then first thing that comes to the top of your mind. Okay. What's a favorite book of yours? Gosh, that one's hard. Oh, okay. That one's so hard. <laughs> I have a hard time picking a favorite book because I can't read the same book twice. Ah. I can't. I Is there it. one that has stood out in your memories? being better than others. I really liked the Aragon series. I okay. like fantasy books. All I right. like there to be magic. I want the world to be magical. So I yeah. like those sorts of stories where there's the, yeah, magical powers and dragons and stuff. And so okay. I, I really like those. I'm reading a series right now that's the the book of the Malazans or Malazans. I don't know. I've never heard it said out loud. Hmm. So, hmm. you know, it's just in my head. And I'm on book eight of like 13. <laughs> There it's you good go. to have a long-running series. <laughs> yeah. So I, I like those where you get to have the big world building and uh, complicated, like, plots and subplots. And, oh, I like the Game of Thrones books. I okay. did like those, mm-hmm. but I think we're done. I don't know. I don't I don't believe another one's coming out. I've given up. <laughs> he writes too much. He writes too slow. <laughs> <laughs> and too slow. Yeah. I've given up, but yeah. nah. It's uh, that whole fantasy sci-fi genre. That's, cool. that's where I'm at. All right. Yes. So the next question is simply igneous or sedimentary. And I assume that's if you were a rock, what rock would you be? Oh, I'm igneous. All right. I'm hard-headed and <laughs> crystalline. <laughs> yes. And if you were sedimentary, what, what would that mean? Oh, the were? sedimentary ones, they are, they are more um, flexible. They're okay. The, so igneous and metamorphic rocks are called the hard rocks, and sedimentary rocks are soft rocks. Okay. And so uh, the the igneous rocks are born of fire, and so they are they're heated. So you've got like Metallica uh, and Brian Adams. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, I like it. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, what's a hidden talent of yours? I can do a creepy doll face. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Please, demonstrate. Okay, because I can close one eye without moving the other. You want to look right toward the uh, the camera there. Oh, my. That's excellent. Uh, that that is, that's good. Yeah, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> it's, that's, that's my party trick is I can just go. <laughs> that's some nightmare fuel <laughs> for sure I love it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's funny <laughs> I've never seen that talent before how do you figure that out um, my mom liked to make faces when we were kids uh-huh. and so like I, I learned to wiggle my nose I can do the bunny nose I can do the wow. one eyebrow without the other oh, yeah. and I can do my ears it's yes, just a little bit. Yeah, so, like, she really worked on facial control. <laughs> wow, good for her. And I bet she is a great grandma. Right? Yeah. <laughs> she's she can she can stick her tongue to her nose. So she, I can't. I I didn't get that far, but I I learned how to control one eye without the other. <laughs> now, what about what about one? You know, like looking in one direction. Do a I can bit, do the, that. The chameleon I used thing. to be able to to cross my eyes and uncross one without uncrossing the other, but I've lost that. I skill. think I can sort of do it. Yeah, uh, you're getting, you're close. Yeah, yeah. I, I got to practice. I, yeah, you, you, that one falls out of practice pretty easy, but I used to be able to do that too. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, long story short, we're just weird in Southern Iowa. <laughs> yeah, you got to have something to do in the, you know, the off days. Yeah, it's true. 
Uh, what is your favorite thing to do in the spring? And I suppose we should qualify that. Yeah, favorite thing to do in a spring that has not been snowed under like this one has. <laughs> I just like getting outside. Yeah. I like to go outside and listen to the birds come back and yeah. watch the flowers come up. I like to garden. So Briar and I put in a garden while we're waiting. But last year, you know, we did our garden thing. And so we're anxiously waiting. I should get my seeds started soon. Yeah. So. But yeah, we like to garden and just do things outside before it gets too hot. Get that fresh air yeah. in. Oh, yes. Yeah, you've got like a two-month window where it's decent and yeah. then yes. it's hot. <laughs> yes. Yeah, pretty boring stuff, standard stuff. It's always good to be outside, though. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, last one, man, probably the hardest, arguably. What is one word that comes to your mind when you think of Shattersea College? And you ask that to somebody who can do the, eye, the eyelid thing. <laughs> <laughs> Community. Community. It's a nice, tight-knit community here. Everybody knows each other, and you really have that support structure around here where you do, like, I can walk across campus and even, like, on the way here, ran into somebody and they struck up a conversation and we talked, and, like, they may not know who I am exactly, but they know I'm here and I'm part of their community. Mm -hmm. And so there's really that sense of everybody wants to be excited for each other. And, like, you see the students and how excited they were for their wrestler um, who mm -hmm. just yeah. made it to the championships, right? right? Yep. So it's just really nice to see that close-knit community because, you know, you don't get that everywhere. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I think, yeah, community. We're a happy That's little a good community. answer. Yeah. Well, Tawny, thanks so much for coming in yeah, and spending a few minutes with us. It's uh, always always exciting to talk to you because I, I just love the energy that you bring in. If it's rock related, it, I know you are the resource. Uh, <laughs> I never take my uh, rocks for granted. Uh, yep. <laughs> Zing. Ah, gotta close you out. You know, I, I like that that um, as a uh, whatever in, incorrect thing because it it's kind of got some some fact to it. It'd be a, that stability. Yeah. You, can, you can take it for granted. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not just a Rick and Morty reference. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, well, I really appreciated you guys having me on. I'm not going to lie. I've been waiting. I've been. I've seen once I got here and I saw the Farcast. I was like, "That's it. I'm going to do this podcast." And, hey, I'm glad we got you in. Yeah. Oh, yes, <laughs> your bucket list is. I complete. have peaked. I'm ready for retirement. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Yeah. <laughs>